copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all cars broadcast 295 regarding a suspicious man. Assist the detective. That's all. Rolling the credits. tried our new gasoline. This new all-purpose Rio Grande crack embodies twice as many vital ingredients as found in ordinary fuel. And all are so expertly combined in just the right ratio to give you the gasoline of all purposes. Police car drivers and the pilots of other public serving automobiles throughout California were the proving ground for this sensationally new motor fuel. And their unsinned acclaim convinced us that all-purpose Rio Grande crack should be made available to the general motoring public. They found its scientific blend of additional ingredients made up of gasoline that has everything, each element contributing its part to the 100% performance of which each car is capable. Maximum motor car efficiency at minimum cost is yours. The emergency benefits of all-purpose Rio Grande cracked are no further away than the nearest red and white Rio Grande station. So get a tank full in the morning and watch your car take you places more swiftly, more smoothly, yes, and more economically than ever before. The facts around which tonight's story has been built have been taken from the files of the Sheriff of Los Angeles County and the personal files of Detective Nick Harris, President of the International Secret Service Association, an organization composed of nationally known heads of detective agencies throughout the world. We have therefore asked Mr. Harris to open our program. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's story is one of the most baffling and at the same time one of the most interesting cases that has ever passed through my office. Beginning as a case that appeared to be merely another job of checking up on an errant husband, this case developed into a mysterious and sinister affair. It led to the solution of a series of crimes that read like fiction the cold-bloodedness and calm, dispassionate manner of the criminal in his recital of his crime left little doubt in the minds of any of us who worked on the case that he was guilty. However, we shall wait until the end of the program to show you how conclusively we prove to this man the unprofitableness of crime. <laughs> On the late afternoon of March 31st, 1920, Nick Harris was preparing to leave his office for the day. As he moved toward the door, his reception clerk ushered in an attractive woman of middle age. Mr. Harris, this is Mrs. Harold Nesbitt. She told me that her business with you was urgent and asked to see you right away. Oh, yeah. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Nesbitt? Thank you. Now then, what seems to be the trouble? Well, I'd like your office to do some work for me, Mr. Harris, but, well, at the moment, I'm without funds. Oh, I see. Well, go ahead, Mrs. Nesbitt. To be perfectly frank, I'm suspicious of my husband. Suspicious? In what way? He's away from home a great deal and tries to explain it by saying he works as a secret service man. <laughs> and you have reason to believe this isn't true, is that it? Yes. He tries to tell me these long absences are because of his duties. He says he's not at liberty to make any further explanations. Has he ever shown you any credentials of any kind? No, he never has. In other words, you're in doubt as to how he really makes his money. Well, yes. But that isn't the important thing to me. What I want to know mainly is whether or not there's another woman mixed up in this business. Oh, yes, yes, of course. That and what he's done with $2,600 of mine that he said he was going to invest in a bank up north. Have you ever spoken to him about this money? Dozens of times. I've never gotten a satisfactory answer from him, even though he knows that it represents my life savings. How long have you and Mr. Nesbitt been married? Since last November. We were married in Spokane, Washington. And when did you come down here to live? We came to Hollywood about two months ago. I see. Where is your husband now, Mrs. Nesbitt? He's away on another one of those mysterious trips. He didn't tell me how long he'd be gone. He never tells me. I just have to wait until he comes back. Well, when he does come back, you telephone us right away. And if he communicates with you, you try to find out where he is. I'll do that. I'm afraid I'll have to leave you now, Mrs. Nesbitt. I have a rather urgent appointment. But uh, I'd like to have you give any additional facts you can to Mr. Armstrong, one of our investigators, before you leave the office. Certainly, and thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, let me remind you once more. Get in touch with us the minute you hear from your husband. Nick 
Harris, dismissing the matter from his mind as one of dozens of similar cases, went on to his appointment, leaving Mrs. Nesbitt to tell the rest of her story to Superintendent J.B. Armstrong. But the next morning, when Harris returned to his desk, Armstrong entered. Uh, Chief, looks like we've got something really hot on that Nesbitt case. Nesbitt case? Yeah. Oh, yes, the woman who was in here yesterday afternoon. That's it. <laughs> Well, what's got into you, Armstrong? Cases like that are commonplace enough. Well, there's nothing commonplace about this one. Listen, Chief, do you remember the robbery of the Hilton department store a few weeks ago? I'm not likely to forget it. A store protected by my agency. Well, you remember that besides the 32000 in cash they got out of the safe, those burglars got away with $8,000 in Liberty Bond? Sure, but what's that got to do with the Nesbitt case? Well, that's what I'm getting to. The robbery was on a Sunday night, last March 7th. Now, Mrs. Nesbitt tells me her husband was away all that night. Well, what of it? She said that both of them went to Catalina Island the next day and that on the boat, Nesbitt opened up a mysterious handbag that he always carries and showed her part of the contents. What do you mean a mysterious handbag? Well, his wife says he never goes anywhere without it, never lets it out of his sight except when he's sleeping. Oh, well, go on. What did she see in this handbag? He showed her a bundle of Liberty Bonds that he said were for her. $8,000 worth of them. $8,000 worth, huh? Mm-hmm. But get this. You remember that the men who robbed the Hilton Department store tied up the night watchman with strips torn from linen counter coverings? Yes. Well, Mrs. Nesbitt swears these bonds her husband showed her were wrapped with a strip of linen cloth. Say, this does look like a break, Armstrong. At any rate, this fellow Nesbitt warrants investigation. You'd better detail a couple of our best men to the case right away. <laughs> went by and still no word from Mrs. Nesbitt, while operatives kept a futile day and night watch on the Hollywood bungalow where she and her husband lived. At last, the investigators decided to enlist the aid of the sheriff's office. Within a short time, deputies Harvey Bell and Robert Coots arrived on the scene, and the suspect and his wife were trailed to their home in Hollywood, where the officers kept an all-night vigil. Then, on the following morning... Well, what do you think we ought to do, boys? We've been here all night. I say let's make the pinch, Armstrong. Take Nesbitt down to the station and question him. I agree with Bell. The story Nesbitt's wife told you is excuse enough for making the arrest. Well, I admit there's not much point in hanging around here any longer. Still, we haven't got a warrant. So I think maybe we'd better wait until he leaves the house before we try to take him in. Well, I suppose that's the smartest thing to do. But we want to get hold of that grip he had with him last night. If we expect to get any evidence against him, we've got to get a hold of it. Suppose Nesbitt doesn't leave the house today. Well, we'll have to take our chance on that. Well, I sure could use some sleep right now. Yeah, I guess all of us could. What about that grip? If Nesbitt doesn't... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? I thought I heard a noise like a door being unbolted. I do suppose. Yeah, look. It's Nesbitt. He's coming out. His wife's with him. What do we do about her? Well, I don't think we'll have any trouble getting her to come along as a witness against him. She's pretty sore. Say, Armstrong, Nesbitt hasn't got that grip with him. Yeah, well, never mind. While you and Couch make the arrest, I'll see if I can't get into the house in the back way. He'll be around somewhere. All right. Come on, Bob. Let's get this fellow. Hey, just a minute there. Is your name Nesbitt? Why? Who wants to know? I do. We're from the sheriff's office. I'm sure. Go on. Beat it. I don't like cops. Now, that's what we thought. You're coming down to the station where we can have a little talk with you. Oh, no, I'm not. No business with me. Now, get out of here. Oh, it's tough, huh? Well, it won't do you any good, so you might as well get back in the house without any trouble. Well, I call the wagon. I won't do anything the kind. I'll tell you, here, get your hands off me, you dirty. You won't take me to, to any station. Bandit! 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 Oh, yeah. oh. Ah, that's got him. He's down. Put your handcuffs on him, Coach. All right. All right, Nesbitt, up on your feet. You've no right to do this to me. Oh, go on. Get out of the house and hurry it up. And you, Margaret, my own wife, letting these men arrest me. It wasn't my fault you got knocked down. You shouldn't have struck that officer. Struck him? I wish I'd killed him. And it is your fault. You can't fool me. You install this. I know you. You and your T-Rex. You wait, Margaret. You wish we were dead a hundred times before I'm through with oh, you. shut up, Nesbitt. Get on in there. Now, sit down and behave yourself. Now, if you'll show me where the phone is, Mrs. Nesbitt, I'll call the wagon. Yeah, yes, of course. It's right through here. Yeah, okay. The black grip of his, Bell. I found it right here in the living room when I came in through the back. Leave that grip alone. You've no right to touch it. Now, don't you think you've given us enough trouble for a while, Nesbitt? Now, sit back and keep quiet. I demand to know the meaning of this. Coming into the home of an innocent man? I suppose you put up that fight outside there just for your health, huh? Of course not. I thought you were members of a smuggling gang I've been hunting. I'm a government man. <laughs> a government man, eh? Well, let's see your credentials. Well, I... I haven't got them with me. Oh, quit lying, Nesbitt. You're lucky you didn't get yourself shot resisting arrest that way. If you take me to San Diego, I can clear up everything. I've got the proof and safety part boxes down there. Yeah? Well, we'll take you to the sheriff's office first and see how much you can clear up down there. (laughs) 
Hello, Armstrong. I hurried down here the minute I got your message. Where have they got Nesbitt? Right in there, Mr. Harris. We'd better go in because they're just opening up that black bag of his. Oh, yes. I want to see what's in it. Those Liberty Bonds his wife told us about in particular. As well as these to real estate rent receipts and a whole stock of letters. Mm-hmm. Uh... Oh, hello, Mr. Harris. Hello, Glad Carol. you're here. We're just going through the contents of Nesbitt's grip. How are you, Coots? Uh, did you find those Liberty Bonds? Uh, glad to see you, Harris. Yeah. The bonds are right here on the table, just as Armstrong there described them to us. Oh, yes, I see. Mm-hmm. Tied up with a linen strip, all right. Now all we have to do is check the numbers on them with those of the stolen bonds. If you think those bonds are stolen, you're badly mistaken. I have every legal right to them. We'll find out about that later, Mr. Nesbitt. Nope, they don't check. I want you to take a look at some of the other stuff we found in this grip, Mr. Harris. There's something screwy here, or I'll eat your hat. Seems to be mostly papers and letters. Yeah, Take a look at them. Here's seven marriage licenses, each one made out in a different name. And these letters were all written by women head over heels in love. That is, all of them that I've glanced over so far. No, they're not all love letters. Three or four of them here seem to be from parents, anxious to find out where their daughters are. What's all this stuff piled up here? Women's jewelry, mostly bracelets and rings, including several wedding rings. Well, everything in here seems to be pertaining to women, huh? That's right. Maybe our friend here can give us some explanation. What about it, Nesbitt? I don't know anything about that junk. About the grip at an express company sale. All that stuff was in there then. I've never gone through it very thoroughly. You sure of that? Certainly. You know, there's just the chance he's telling the truth about the grip. Nothing in here has his name on it. Well, there may be an answer for that one, too. Are you quite sure your name is Nesbitt? Why, uh, that is... Uh... Come on, now. What's your real name? Watson. And your first name? James. James P. James P. Watson, eh? Why were you using the name of Nesbitt? Well, I... There was a little trouble with a former wife of mine. Here's something odd. A writing tablet with the signatures of several different women on separate pages. Signatures are on the bottoms of blank sheets of paper. Mm, that is odd. What about this writing pad, Watson? I don't know. Must have been in there with the rest. And you don't know anything about it? No. Well, quite a few signatures here. Looks as if somebody had gotten hold of them with the intention of later writing some sort of message above these names. That's what I think, too. If that's the case, then... Say, Armstrong, look yeah. here. Yeah. What do you make of this? Margaret Windham. Why, that's Mrs. Nesbitt's maiden name, Chief. After she told me about it, I included it in my report to you. What have you got to say now, Watson, now that we've found your wife's maiden name among these signatures? You still deny knowing anything about this stuff? I don't know a thing, I tell you. All right, Watson. If you don't want to talk, that's your business. But when we get to the bottom of this thing, I've got a hunch you wish you had. <laughs> Although Watson had proved the legal purchase of the Liberty Bonds, within the next hour, deputies Coots and Bell had placed their manacled prisoner in a police car and were racing toward San Diego, intent on opening the safe deposit boxes Watson had rented there. The deputies had found the receipts for the rental of these boxes in the little black whip, and so drove directly to the bank on their arrival in the southern city. Well, here we are. Watson's still asleep, huh? Yep, he's been sleeping ever since we left San Juan Capistrano. Come on, fella, wake up. Hey, wake up there. We're here. Hey, shake him up a little. That'll rouse him. Say, uh, you're going to wake up. Hey, Bill, look. There's blood all over my hands. Well, I shook him. Hey, good Lord. You suppose he's committed suicide? It's like he's tried it anyway. His throat's cut. We'd better get him to a hospital. Will he live, Doctor? It's pretty hard to say yet. However, we're going to give him a blood transfusion. That may save him. Mm-hmm. Well, we've got to be leaving. We've arranged for a guard. Let us know how it turns out. I'll get in touch with you boys the minute I know anything definite. Uh, thanks, Doc. So long. So long, boys. Well, well folks, I guess the next thing to do is go back to that bank and have a look in those boxes. That's right. You know, I'm beginning to think this case is deeper than it looks on the outside. A man doesn't generally try to commit suicide unless he has a pretty good reason. That's what I've been thinking. And so far, we haven't got enough against Watson to justify his doing what he did. Anyway, we'll have to keep our eyes on him from now on. He may try it again. <laughs> Los Angeles, Nick Harris had been able to locate another wife of Watson, the woman then living in Sacramento. At his request, she immediately came south to aid in the investigation of her husband. Within an hour of her arrival, she was seated in Harris's office. Present also were Mrs. Margaret Nesbitt and Superintendent Armstrong. You say Watson married you under the name of Herbert Logan, is that it? Yes. What was your maiden name before this marriage? Henrietta Kennedy. I can't understand this thing. It just doesn't seem to make sense. I can understand your feeling, of course, Mrs. Logan. So can I, my dear. We've both been made the victims of an outrageous deceit. I just can't believe that Herbert could do such a thing. I, 
I loved him so. Well, I can pity you, but don't you love on that monster? He isn't worth it. What was the date of your marriage to Watson, Mrs. Logan? We were married in August of last year. <laughs> Just three months before he married me. What I can't understand, Mr. Harris, is how you happened to find out who I was. The different name and all. Well, we found your photograph in a grip that Watson carried. There was no name on it, but we got in touch with the photographer who made it, and he told us your address. Oh, I see. Now, there's something I'd like to have you ladies do for me, if you will. Oh, anything at all, Mr. Harris. Oh, yes, of course. We found rent receipts to an Ocean Park apartment house among Watson's possessions. I'd like to take both of you down there with me and see if you can identify any of the articles in that apartment as belonging to you. Will you do that? Of course. Yes, certainly. Well, then, if it's all right with you, we'll go right away. Well, geez, that seems to be about all that was left in this apartment. Now, you're sure, ladies, that you don't recognize anything here? No, there's nothing here I ever set eyes on before. And you, Mrs. Logan? This is the first time I ever saw any of these things. Well, that seems to be that. Hey, hold on a minute, Chief. I think I've got something here. What is it, Armstrong? Well, this pair of white kid gloves we found in that trunk full of ladies' wearing apparel. Look, there's a name marked on the inside of one of them. Let's see it. Mm hmm. Ruth Chandler, eh? Yeah, probably another of Watson's wives. Oh, this is awful. I can't. I can't believe it. No wonder. Let's have a look at this fur neck piece. Maybe there's a name somewhere on that, too. This one here? Yeah. No, I can't seem to find any. I wonder what this stuff is along the collar edge. Let me see. Looks like some kind of substance is dried on there. Hey, you know what it looks like to me, Chief? What? Dried blood. By George, I think you're right, Armstrong. At any rate, I'm going to turn this neck piece over to the police chemist for analysis the minute we get back to town. <laughs> went by. Watson had been removed from San Diego to the prison ward of the Los Angeles County Hospital, while telegrams went out to police throughout the West asking for information. Before long, answers to these wires began coming in, answers loaded with dreadful significance. A meeting of officers was held in the office of Sheriff Klein with Detectives Bell, Coots, and Armstrong present. I called you together, boys, to give you some new facts on the Watson case. Mm. I'm warning you, though, in advance that some of them are pretty startling. We've got evidence of swindles, misuse of the mails, and forgery. The only thing we haven't got against him is the theft of those Liberty Bonds. He's clear on that score anyway. I've got an idea, Sheriff. Those charges are going to be just like chicken feed of what will eventually get on him. Exactly. And that's the main reason I called you boys to my office. You mean you dug up evidence of something more serious? Not evidence, exactly. But some pretty significant clues. You remember that our chemists proved there was human blood on the fur neck piece found in that Ocean Park apartment house? Sure. And we have reason to believe the neck piece belonged to Ruth Chandler. A Montana divorcee that Watson married up in San Francisco last December. What does that prove, Sheriff? Ruth Chandler has been reported missing for the past three months. Well, right? Besides the Chandler girl, I have reports here of six other women who are missing. And every one of them was married to James Watson. Good Lord, it doesn't seem possible. Uh, maybe not, but here they are. Andrea Garvey, a young waitress of Wallace, Idaho. Using the name of Milton Taft, married her at Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Helen Gibbs, Seattle widow, said his name was Arthur Gillespie. Married at Port Townsend, Washington. Roberta Carter, Spokane. Married her under the name of Charles Hanson at North Yakima. How long have these women been missing, Sheriff? In every case, it seems that they disappeared within about three months after the wedding. And if our suspicions are correct, it holds their own murder. Now, well, here's the balance of the list. Geraldine Frank, Vancouver maid. Married as Thomas Schofield in Vancouver. Eleanor Fairweather, wealthy English widow of Vancouver. As Gregory Houston, he married her in Tacoma. Anne Freeman, an Idaho girl, married in Calgary, Alberta. That seems incredible. You don't suppose he married, murdered all of them, do you? Well, there's no way of knowing, Armstrong. As a matter of fact, we're not even sure that he's murdered anybody. How do you suppose he managed to meet all these women, Joe? Oh, no, that wasn't hard. He lured most of his victims of the advertisements and personal columns, describing himself as a businessman, a government agent, an author, any profession that appeared to touch his fancy. Outside of these missing girls, what's the record on his marriages, so far as you know? Well, altogether, we know of 22 women he's married. We have letters and telegrams from many people positively identifying. And all of them had a little money or property cashed away somewhere, huh? Mm -hmm, that's right. In most cases, it seems that Watson disappeared as soon as he got control of it. I'm George Sheriff. I've never run across anything like this before in my life. Oh, pardon me a moment. Sure. Yes? Sheriff Klein, this is Nick Harris. Oh, yes, yes, Nick. I just received a wire from the sheriff of King County in the state of Washington. Yes? They found the body of a woman under a culvert up there, apparently murdered. Certain things they've found out lead them to believe the bigamist we have in custody might know something about the case. Well, now, maybe that's the break we've been looking for, Nick. i tell you what you do. Meet me at the county hospital in a half an hour, and we'll talk to Watson. Fine. I'll see you at the hospital, then. Come on, boys. We're going over to the county hospital. And I think when we get back here, we'll be able to pin a murder charge on our friend Watson. <laughs> Later, 
the officers met in the lobby of the county hospital, where they were joined by Thomas Lee Woolwine, Los Angeles District Attorney. But now came a severe setback. I'm afraid I've got some disappointing news for you, gentlemen. What's the matter, Nick? Well, just as I was leaving my office, I received another wire from the sheriff up at King County, Washington. Yes? The body of the woman they found up there has been identified. And it's been established beyond a doubt that our prisoner had nothing to do with the case. Uh Uh-oh. Does Watson know anything about the second wire? He doesn't know anything about the first one yet, Mr. Wilwine. Well, that's good. So far, we've merely the bigamy charge against him. But I'm confident he's a murderer. Perhaps a mass killer. I think so, too. The trouble is, I have nothing, not even a portion of a body, to base my opinion on. I guess we'll just have to wait and see what he has to tell us. Well, Watson, it looks like we finally have the good sign. They found the body of a murdered woman near Seattle, and there doesn't seem to be any doubt in their minds as to who did it. You might as well own up, Watson. It'll go easier with you in the long run. And you might as well tell us what you did with the body of Ruth Chandler, too. We found where you'd been living in Ocean Park. Well, gentlemen... I'll tell you what I'll do. If the district attorney would agree to a life sentence in California, I'll tell all I know. I'm not anxious to go back to Washington to be hung. I'm not making any promises, Watson. All right, then, Mr. Wilburn. I'm not talking. I see. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. If your statements impress me as being fair, truthful, and complete, I think perhaps I will be able to recommend a sentence of life imprisonment. That's fair enough, Mr. Wilburn. I'll tell everything I can remember. Uh, What about Ruth Chandler? Did you murder her? Yes, I did. Uh, What did you do with her body? It's buried in the hills near El Centro. I can't tell you just where. I'll have to show you. Why did you kill her? She was becoming a nuisance. Asked questions all the time and nagged at me. I killed her with an axe at a spot near Long Beach. Then I took her body in my car and drove to the place where I buried her. Well, that's over a hundred miles away from where you murdered her. Why did you drive so far? I don't know. I guess it just seems like a good place. You say you'll be able to take us to the spot and show us the grave? Yes, whenever you say so. Do you think you feel well enough to take us in the morning? Yes, I think so. We'll we'll be back in the morning, Watson. But remember this. The Lord help you if you're lying. Watson did not lie. The following day, he led the officers to a shallow grave in a narrow canyon along the slopes of Sugarloaf Mountain near El Centro, California. When the pitiful body of Ruth Chandler was exhumed and he was asked to identify it, Watson showed no remorse but merely said, Yes, that's her body. That's the woman known as Ruth Chandler, whom I'm killed and buried. Back in Los Angeles, Watson was put to an intensive grilling as to what had become of the other women he had married, who later had been reported as missing. I want you to tell me what happened to Helen Gibbs. The woman you married up at Port Townsend, Washington. I, uh, I killed her too, uh, Mr. Harris. Where did you kill her? I can't remember exactly. I was fishing with her in some river in Idaho. I guess it was the St. Joe River. I pushed her in and she fell under some logs. What women had you killed before this Gibbs woman? Well, there was Andrea Garvey and a woman named Fairweather. What were the circumstances of your killing Mrs. Fairweather? We were walking along Lake Washington. It just seems as though there was an impulse. I threw her down, or rather pushed her right into the water and held her there. Well, why? What was your reason for killing her? It seems like something came over me to do it. We were crawling. She went to the bottom of the lake, I guess. Is that the one whose body you said was recovered? No, uh, that was Andrea Garvey. Well, before we get to that, tell me, what were your sensations when you drowned out on her fair weather? It just seemed a sensation of ease. Just something well done. Instead of remorse, I had passive uh, pleasure. Well, what about Roberta Carter? How did you kill her? To the body lake and an impulse came over me. I hit the girl. Something said, go ahead, and I went ahead. It was just getting dusk. What did you hit her with? A rock. I just grabbed up a rock. Was there shrubbery near? Yes, and I pulled her back there. That is, I had to hide the body near the lake, and then later got a boat and rowed out and sank the body. Oh, was the body ever recovered? I don't know. I don't think so. Very cold water keeps them down. Getting back to Andrea Garvey. How did you kill her? We were in a little shack out in the woods. We had a quarrel, and I pushed her pretty hard, and her head struck the corner of one of the bunks. What did you do then? I went outside to the car and got a hammer. Uh, something seemed to tell me she was nearly dead. The best thing to do was finish up, uh, do something with the body. I finished her with the hammer. Had you previously had any desire to kill her? Yes, uh, but I fought it off. Well, what did you do with the body? Well, I put it in the shack, and I burnt the closing. I burnt the shack, too. Now, where did the killing of Geraldine Frank occur? In Washington. We were out on the lake. I hit her with an oar. 
Well, what did you do about the blood on the oar? Uh, there wasn't any. Uh, she had a hat on. The oar seemed to daze and kind of paralyze her. I believe I threw a rock at her or struck her while she was in the water. Did the rock strike her head? Yes, it seems like I threw four. What other women have you killed? Well, there was uh, Phyllis Bedell. Phyllis Bedell? I don't believe we've heard about her. Where was she killed? In Spokane, uh, Washington. Well, how did that come about? Uh, something told me to push her into the falls. The Spokane River is quite a river. I pushed her into the water just above the falls. I don't know if the body was ever recovered. Well, did you strike her? No, I don't recall that I did. There's a big falls there, and you can get above it. I just uh, pushed her in. And that's all the women you killed? There aren't any others? Well, I think so, but I'm not sure. I may have forgotten one or two. Forgotten one or two? Good Lord. I ask you to believe me, Mr. Harris. I'm not really bad. No? Well, Watson, if you're not really bad, then our prisons are full of noble, virtuous souls. <laughs> a moment, Mr. Harris will conclude our program. Before presenting the closing facts, friends, I want to urge each of you who hasn't done so to put the new all-purpose Rio Grande Cracked to a personal test. I want you to find out to your own complete satisfaction the truth of what I have told you about this radically new and different gasoline. That the perfect blending of a double portion of ingredients does give you a motor fuel that, for once in automotive history, meets every purpose. Makes your car surpass any previous performance in every department of driving. Get this new gasoline, where you see the new cracked poster at the red and white Rio Grande stations. It's liquid dynamite. And now, Mr. Harris. James P. Watson, as we learned, was the prisoner's real name. He was sentenced to a term of life imprisonment in San Quentin. He subsequently confessed to having murdered 26 women, 11 of whom he murdered in cold blood. He is indeed a wasted life that testifies that crime cannot pay. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Always calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation of broadcast 295 regarding a suspicious person. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rose and the Rick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present the case of the teardrop charm. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.